Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeremy Reynolds, and I'm the Associate Professor of Clarinet at the University of Denver Lamont School of Music and the Associate Principal Clarinetist of the Colorado Springs Philharmonic. And my esteemed colleague. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Grantier. I just retired from the US Navy Band in Washington, DC, where I was the principal clarinetist. And I am now the assistant professor of clarinet at Southern Utah University, where I'll be starting there in the fall as the um, director of Woodwinds. And very excited to be here today. And um, Jill, why don't you um, introduce yourself as well? Um, hi, can you hear me and see me? Hi, uh, my name is Jill Mall. I am a um, clarinet enthusiast uh, and I am a physical therapist and longtime friend of Laura. Um, we'll talk about that later. And I am living, I live in Orlando, Florida now. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Jill. This is gonna be great. I'm I'm honored, like beyond honored. You don't even know, like I've got like like raw, I've got like um, celebrity, you know, in anxiety right now <laughs> <laughs> with y'all. <laughs> so for our talk this morning, the basically what we came up with is for our adult adult enthusiast is you know what what does playing clarinet mean to you what is it to you is it a, is it a hobby as it says is it a hobby is it a career is it both and um the you know the objectives that we were thinking about is you know um what does it basically mean to you to say that you're a clarinet player is it is it all about making music um is it you know is it because you like to collaborate with others is it basically like your existence you know like eve like you know just like Jill said, she's a therapist, but you know, you'll hear her story as a clarinetist. So like, you know, like how does, how does clarinet mean in your life and, and what kind of personal connection, you know, do you make with your instrument and with music? And so that's kind of sort of the objectives that we wanted to sort of discuss today during our talk. Yeah. And I was going to say, um, if anyone that's, it's participating, if you have any experiences or, or questions just you can put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them as as we go along but um your your feedback is really important because the reason we're here is to kind of share you know why we like playing the clarinet why we like collaborating with others what does it mean to us and why do we identify so personally with with our instrument so um let's see where are we okay so Jeremy, how is your identity identified? You know, how's your identi identity defined by the clarinet? I'm just curious. <laughs> well, I will say that, you know, in, in the beginning, I just liked playing clarinet, you know, and then it sort of became, you know, it was a passion. And then it was just one of the things where I thought I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I always had to do it. It was never a question. I just went, you know, full on. And, you know, and then and then it became like I, I, need, I needed to be an orchestral player, and I played seven years in Tucson Symphony. Well, six and six and change, I guess you would say. Um, and then, you know, when I moved to the University of Denver, I will have to say at the time I was I was just very concerned about job security. So it really at that point I wouldn't. I mean, I was I was a clarinet player, but it was also my way of of making sure that. I could go skiing and I could, you know, do the stuff I wanted to. And I kind of joke that, you know, I, I, I just, I want to do really, really cool things. And I want students who practice well and, um, and they do really, they're very successful and, and they do what they want to do in music. And so, but now it, of course it has shifted to where it's now all about, you know, fun stuff I want to do, or it also can help me travel the world and, you know, different projects that I want to do or different composers that I want to collaborate with. And so I think, yes, I think clarinet is just my voice, but I don't know if I would, you know, I mean, I could identify as a cellist or a violist. It's just, I, I'm a musician. It just so happens that the clarinet is what I gravitate towards, I think is where I'm at probably these days. Yeah. That's a great response. I, you know, I just can't imagine life without the clarinet. It's like you said, I, I grew up, you know, I started well, I was riding horses and I developed an allergy. And so, uh, you know, the band director called my parents and said, 
hey, your daughter might be, uh, you know, proficient in clarinet or saxophone. Of course, my dad's like, she's not playing the saxophone. It's too loud. So, so, um, you know, I picked the clarinet and um, I don't know, it just always kind of, it was always there for me. I, I just feel like it, I just always enjoyed practicing and always practice ahead. Um, you know, I really didn't take clarinet lessons until I started in, in high school. And, um, you know, so I, I just really um, enjoyed playing it. And, and I didn't really think about, and this is my naivete coming in, but when I decided to go off to college, I thought, oh, well, I'll just go off and study music because that's what I know and that's what I like and enjoy. And at the time I wasn't thinking about, hmm, what kind of job am I gonna get? <laughs> And so, um, you know, when I was in college, I just was able to work with, with really good teachers. My, my teachers were, they weren't just my clarinet professor, they were also my, my woodwind quintet coach or my band director, or maybe um, I had, you know, it's, my English teacher was a really great mentor as well. So it was more than just, you know, clarinet teachers that were mentoring me. But, um, you know, even when I won the job in the Navy band, I, I walked in the door playing my clarinet and I walked out of the door playing my clarinet. And um, that was really important to me because I think sometimes when you get into your job, you know, different things happen, you wind up organizing things or, um, you know, you, you can get away from, from what's important to you. And I, I think one of the things I really tried to stay true to was, hey, I'm a clarinet player. I wanna play my clarinet. Yes, I can mentor and, and lead you know, 35 people, and that's great. And I'm helping develop their careers, but I just want to play. And, um, and that's all. And I think it's okay to say, you know what, that, that's what I enjoy. And that's what I do. I won't say that I'm a one trick pony, but um, it's just when I think about what do I love to do, that that's what I love to do and, and to, you know, uh, help others in, realize their goals and aspirations as well. So you know, I'm just one one giant clarinet nerd, and, and <laughs> I'm looking forward to working with students and, and developing them after after the you know after I graduated from band. So, um, Jill, I'd I'd like to know your thoughts. You know, your your career path has been very interesting, so I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, yes, yeah, I start from the beginning. I mean, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so all during high school um, and uh, and then college, I was a, a good clarinet player. It was what I did. And I was first chair, yada, yada. Um, and then I went to, um, I, I actually just, I always actually wanted to be a doctor or a teacher. And then when I got to college, I stayed playing, but I didn't, I, I was in the marching band and I was in the wind ensemble and I took lessons. I did a jury, et cetera. And then find that, and then that's, I met Laura during one of those summers, but I, I always knew that I, I wanted to follow a career in, in something science, something science. So I um, always just, I always played. That was, that was just what I did. And so I did a degree in biology actually from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, my undergrad teacher was um, Don Ayler. Um, and then uh, I went to a summer music course in Switzerland and that's where I met um, Dr. Laura uh, in 1990. Um, and um, so then we, um, and once I got my degree in biology, I decided I became a went on to grad school to be a physical therapist. But the moment that I stepped on to campus at Medical College of Virginia and VCU, like I, I have to play. I am not. I couldn't stop playing. So I just went over to the campus of VCU and figured out. Of course, there was no internet, so I just went over to the campus and looked around and figured out that the clarinet professor there was Dr. Charles West. So knocked on the door, Chuck's here, by the way, uh, knocked on the door. Hi, I'm Jill, I'm a clarinet player. I'm over at the medical school. I'm, play, I'm in physical therapy school. What can I do? So he welcomed me with open arms to um, his program and put me in a couple ensembles. Um, we kept playing with him there. And um, 
then I uh, we went to the fish hawk competition in Indiana. It's my only time in Chicago with, with, ever has been one day with Chuck West. Um, and then um, from there, after I got my physical therapy degree, I moved to Orlando. First thing I did was look in the newspaper for a group to play with. Um, and so I joined the current community concert band that I joined back then um, in, uh, in 1996. And I've been playing with them ever since. In the meantime, I kept up with, I, I kept up with, I met Dr. Keith Coons at UCF and kind of um, did a little, did some things at UCF, but not, not as much as I could, as what I'd like to. Um, I was able to go on tour with UCF. They needed some extra players. And so they took myself and some adults with the college to Czechoslovakia and Hungary in 2001. Um, just prior to that, the year before, I was hired by a friend of mine to go to Taiwan for three weeks to play in an orchestra um, in, in two, near 2000. Um, and I've just never stopped playing. I just, it, it is who I am. Like my therapist is my email address and it's clarinet and therapist. So um, for me, it's partially um, the camaraderie of people because mu music people are our people. Um, and then, you know, my best friends from, always are all of my band friends you know plus the the fact of making music with others is just how i how i find my center it really is and so and i've found just you know various things to play in in the last i've lived in orlando now for 26 years and i've just been in various playing some some paid even and i'm like very happy to get paid for playing clarinet um and then uh but mostly uh volunteer groups so that's that's it in a small nutshell, which wasn't small. <laughs> awesome. I like what you said about finding your center yeah. and being with your people. I yes. really feel like, so not only was I in the Navy band, but I also played um, in the Capitol Wind Symphony, which is a really a, a professional wind ensemble in the, in the Washington DC area. Um, we don't get paid. It's all volunteer, but the level of musicianship is really incredible and I would um, love to do that yeah and George Etheridge is the leader of that group and he always it doesn't matter what kind of background you have but he always demands that you play expressively that when you come to rehearsal you make music and you don't just phone it in it doesn't matter if you're a physical therapist a doctor a teacher whatever you are when you're coming into rehearsal you know he's ready to make music and I, I think that's one of the reasons I stayed in that group um, I mean, I've stayed in it currently, even though I'm moving to Utah in August, um, I was in the group for eight years and really have loved every concert we've ever played because again, it's like, you know, you're, you know, in the Navy band, of course, you're working with, you know, uh, different clarinet players in the Capital One Symphony, you're working with different clarinet players and they also have those different interests and, um, but they're all really good musicians. And they have one thing, we have one thing in common is that we want to collaborate and make music together. Yeah. And, and that, that really is, you know, to me, to, to quote my friend, Russell Gross, that's what it's all about is, you know, making music. And I'm just curious if anyone that's listening in on, on the, um, the Zoom presentation, what your thoughts are, what, what is your musical center and what drives you as a clarinet player, whether you're working professionally or, you know, you're uh, just, it, if you're playing in a small chamber group, what is it that you're doing? Or if you are teaching, what is it that drives you, that compels you to, you know, hey, I want to pick up my clarinet today and play some scales, you know? And, and, while, and while people are, you know, it's about to start writing in the chat, I think, Jill, the other thing that I, I really loved what you said is that, you know, the second you stepped on, on campus, you, you know, immediately went to Chuck's office, you sought out constantly seeking out you know places to play and to, you know mm -hmm. keep your clarinet chops up and to stay involved and when i was in tucson um the majority of my students actually were adults and you know i had one who was an anesthesiologist i had mm -hmm. another student who was an autopilot um i had another student who was um an, uh, i think she was an executive at hp and uh in um, silicon valley in california and yeah. they were they were kind of like my bread and butter as well when I played in Tucson Symphony. And we actually had dueling clarinet choirs in Tucson. We had like the East Side Clarinet Choir and we had the Northwest Side Clarinet Choir. And I would always hear about the, you know, the clarinet stuff. I actually call them the clarinet mafia and they all knew I called them the, the Tucson clarinet mafia. And they all had I mean, they were they were absolutely phenomenal people. But, 
you know, actually this, th the, 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 the document I just pulled up right now actually is from a, a former student of mine who, after I left, um, and after I left Tucson, he started, he did some uh, work with John de la Paz, as you see in the middle of the paragraph there. And so I think, Jill, that really, I think that's really cool too, that, you know, that's how all of my adult students found their voice. They found their group hang, you know, at, you know, ways to seek out and then also you know like different community groups wind ensembles you know symphony work uh, there's a um, you know symphony orchestra um, it's those are great ways to keep keep in contact with folks oops I'm just looking up what people said in the chat yes and I I think that you know if we have students that are um, on this on this zoom call you know they're probably looking at okay well what can I Maybe, maybe I don't want to, uh, you, you know, follow a career in music, but I, I'm like, Jill, I want to be a physical therapist, but I still want to play my clarinet. You know, where can someone get started on that? Or maybe in a, they're an adult enthusiast that hasn't played in a while. I have a friend of mine that she was playing professionally and put the horn down for seven years and, and picked it back up and went back to school to, to study and she sounds amazing. So, you know, you hear stories sure. like that of people, they're just like, you know what, I've had enough, I'm going to put it down, and then they come back to it. So I guess my question is, if there's someone that's listening in, that's an adult enthusiast, that maybe they don't know where to start, or right. how, how, how do they pursue what, you know, what kind of suggestions would you guys have? Well, I know as for uh, in my in my area of town, I'm also I've been the membership director for our um, for our community ensemble Orlando Concert Band. Small plug, um, and so uh, so I get all the applications for the new members, and so we have and and the, one of the ways that we ask, you know, how did you find out about us? Most of the people, you know, Google search. You know, so the, just search for community bands in your on your area. Go to the local. Um, either um, a lot of the um, our director is the um, director at the Valencia um, College, which is a the community college in town. And a lot of the community colleges need um, players from the community to kind of help fill their sections too. Sometimes that's so that's, that's a good yeah, yeah a good way to start. Um, and then also um, or the university, but a lot of times the community colleges will welcome adults um, into their into their programs. In fact, even though I was only I think. 15 or 16 years old, my first orchestral experience was playing in the the university orchestra of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, like super duper smarty pants. And yep. the principal bassoon, the principal bassoon player, I think, was about to put something in space. I mean, it was like all this really cool stuff. And I was this little old high school kid. And I took the city bus up to the up to the campus. And, and that's how I got started. And and it was simply by reaching out, like you said, Jill, reaching out to the area college, because oftentimes those professors will conduct ensembles throughout the community. Yes. Yeah. That's really I, great. I found my I found my concert band in 1996 uh, in the newspaper. So <laughs> they, they had a concert. So well, and, and you know, in, in the DC area, not only do you have the Capital Wind Symphony, but you have the Virginia Grand Military Band and the Maryland Winds. So, you know, there are there are opportunities to play all over. And, and I want people that are listening in to know that, you know, if you want to play your clarinet and you want to play somewhere, there there are places that that you can do it. I wish I wish we had kind of like a um, a database of you know com community chamber groups or bands or wind ensembles because they are they are out there and and uh, I think Fairfax Fairfax Virginia has a community band and and so there's just many opportunities if you want to play your instrument now I like in the chat uh, Jessica said she found that she liked teaching younger students let me scroll up younger students one-on-one -on -one in performing chamber music and once she realized that she started pursuing opportunities um, for that and felt more inspired and fulfilled in music making. And I love that because that's a, that's a wonderful responsibility to have is to train the next generation of musicians that are coming up and to have that kind of um, passion and, and um, esprit de corps for really working with younger students and, and you know, instilling that respect and love for the arts and, and performing. And then this is from let me just see. TJ, uh, TJ had a, had a great comment that 
received a bachelor's in performance and um, found that he ended up becoming a mental health therapist, an adjunct professor. And yeah. how clarinet is just part and what a part of him wanted to make a, you know, make a community career out of, out of playing. I mean, that's, that's absolutely, that's great. so awesome and so great. And the best way to stay involved in the, in the, you know, with, with the community and, and, and attending, actually attending forums like this and sharing information, you know, like, just like what we just said, uh, that Jessica commented that they are going to work a, a, on a database of choirs and bands. I mean, what a resource that will be for, for our, for our community. There also is an American Association of Concert Bands um, and commu or community bands or so, you know, one of the, as well. And so, and they have like, they have an annual national, national conference where all the, you know, am amateur band geeks come, come together and have this big giant, like, play, like kind of like an all state for, for adult amateurs really, but it's just, but you just sign up. Um, so if I can find that information, I'll send it to you guys to post it somewhere, I'll send it to ICA. Well, I like it. There's, uh, they're working on a database of clarinet choirs. Yes. Yeah, clarinet well. choirs. Yeah. Because you know, you know, clarinet choir is the ultimate clarinet nerd fest. I mean, that's it really the is. <laughs> you know, you know, and and also yeah. the opportunity to try an auxiliary instrument like bass or contrabass yeah. or E flat. Mm -hmm. I mean, alto. Let's not forget our love for the alto clarinet. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but just that that opportunity to try auxiliary instruments or try something new in a in a safe space i i really um yep. you know I, I tried playing alto clarinet in, in um one of our clarinet choirs and i thought well i know i'm in a safe place so if i sound bad they're not going to make fun of me <laughs> but um yeah no i think i think that's great and um i would actually i actually would have uh if, if tj can respond i'm actually curious how you're doing what ways you're trying to find what kind of performance uh, performance opportunities are you uh, finding in your community, and how did you seek out those those resources? I'd be really curious to hear what TJ has to say about that. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. Like, where do you find those resources? That's a huge one. Yep. Um, <laughs> Suzanne, as I started learning music under three years ago, I chose bass clarinet and loved my deep voice. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. That's great. Bass clarinet has a deep voice, that wonderful re low read sound, right? Okay. Yeah. So TJ did right back and say he's in the Wasatch Winds. Awesome. Ooh, he's looking Are to we... start a quintet. Start a quintet. Yeah, it's great. You know, the, the old joke was, what do you call an optimist? Is an alto clarinet player with a pager. That was <laughs> before. <laughs> that's our long time ago, but yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's funny. Um, and I also think, and Jeremy and I kind of talked about this, um, you know, during the pandemic, we've been able to come together in ways that we just didn't, I just never dreamed of. Like I was able to play in a little clarinet quartet on acapella with some of my, my classmates from the University of Alabama. And that was really special for me because they're, they're wonderful humans and friends. And, um, you know, my friend Rachel and Andrea, um, you, you know, we were able to kind of make some music together that we haven't done in over 25 years so you know just being able to i wish it would have been in person but it but at least we had the technology to collaborate and communicate through music um during a year that was really just you know not normal um so i don't know if anyone has any any thoughts on that but um Jeremy, what other, you had a couple other slides about your, your um, comments from your adult enthusiasts. Yeah, I just, I just, I just uh, brought up a, a different, another one um, where they talk about as an adult. Uh, I look back at what we did together and where I, how it improved. And now I am my improvement as a dramatic and started, you know, for studying, did Albert and all the basics and you can't skip the basics because foundation and everything. Um, this actually also may be from one of my students. This may be maybe from my uh, anesthesiologist. Um, his name is Tom and he was just all up. I mean, we would spend a half hour on every lesson on just Albert scales I and mean, just scales, the Albert 24 varied scales and exercises. And then we eventually graduated into the Behrman. Um, but he was always, and it was kind of funny because, you know, he, he would often relate how being an anesthesiologist would be to, 
you know, how, you know, be very, very careful and meticulous how he had to be in the operating room and how he can bring those skills to his clarinet playing and really close attention to detail. Um, and then he said during COVID, he enjoyed going back through, you know, all of his scales and etude books and the, you know, Brahms and as he mentions in the Bach cello suites. Um, so he said, as an adult enthusiast, this is what I think has been important for me and probably the most important in the progression of most adult players is working on, he, he was very uh, foundation based, you know, really yeah. loved, really loved that foundation. And he played, he, uh, Tom actually played in one of the clarinet choirs I was referring to. He also played, um, there's a, there's a wind symphony um, in, 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 um, in Tucson. Um, and he also at times played in the in the community orchestra. So he played in three different groups. Uh, at, at, at times, he said that he also said he was busier as a clarinet player than he was as a, as a, as an anesthesiologist because he was always running to rehearsal and he always had to practice. And he said he was always crazed. It was funny. Sometimes we even had to like squeeze in lessons in between his rehearsals. And you know, and he's like you know thirty years older than me. And <laughs> but um, so that's what that's what that's what he what he commented on. Uh, during his experience. I like what you said about foundations of playing and maybe we could talk about that a little bit as you know we we have our I, I'm just curious how uh, people listening in how do you practice do you do you go back do you start with your scales um, I know we have a slide on our on foundations of playing but um, I'm going to throw this one out to Jill and she's she's going to give me a big frowny face but I know right yeah so if there's, if I had to go back <laughs> and do it all over again, um, when I went to UNC, going back to college, I, when I went to UNC Chapel Hill, um, there was no minors. There were no minors at Carolina. So I would have done a music minor if I could have. So if I would have, if I, if you asked me, what would you have done differently? I wish I never took all the music theory courses you know, cause I was a biology major. I never took those. I mean, I took lessons and I did ensembles and stuff, but like if they had had a de dedicated music minor, I would have done that. So that's something that I feel like I've been missing. Um, so, and then in, so in the last 25 years that I've been playing, um, you know, non-professionally, um, you know, it's been difficult to find balance because I have two children, I have a job, I have a husband. And so my practice has been, ooh, I have this music that I can't play and I have this solo, so I better go practice it. Um, so I'll be completely honest, I have not gone back to many basics, you know, lately. Um, and I rely on a lot of my good sight reading skills to um, sometimes get through. So there's the, uh, <laughs> there's the uh, full confession. Um, so what I would love to do is that in, so I'm kind of, I, I'm sort of externally motivated, like, and sort of, instead of internally motivated, we can get into the counseling session later, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, there is, if there is something, if there's something that I have to do, then I will work toward it. And I have a hard time, like creating something for myself, but that, that makes sense. So like, I would love to have, oh, you know, so I would love to be able to play Laura's um, Benny Goodman solo with our band and then have to practice it up or, <laughs> or um, play, you know, or if I had something, you know, something to, to prepare for specifically, that's when I, that's when I buckle down, but all confessions going is that I would be a whole much, much better player if I practice more. <laughs> Jill, Jill, when you say buckle down, do yeah. you have, do you have a regiment? Do you have like, do you have, I mean, yeah. Do, do you have like a set core of, of work that you do? No. No? <laughs> no. Okay. So I'm the, yeah. So I'm your, I'm your bad panelist, bad panelist. Um, <laughs> no, I get out. I mean, I, yeah, I, I just, I get out the stuff that I have to play that I'm, that, that's coming up um, that I'm practicing for a concert or practicing for, I mean, I'm in several ensembles and I will br bring out the stuff that, that I found tricky. And then I mean, I'll do my quick little warm ups um, and uh, beforehand, but uh, from, from the, uh, usually from the Rose Etudes or Behrman, but um very little. Um, and I'll plug right now for the clarinet enthusiast. I am a huge Legere Reed fan right now because it saves me the <laughs> European select cut because it saves me time yeah. because I don't have time to sit down and find a read. And does this one play? Does this one play today? Let me get break this one, et cetera. For me, the Legere reads sound fine. 
and they play every single time. And you can just, you just sit down and practice with it and you're, and you don't have to worry about 15 minutes of finding a read. So that has been a lifesaver for me is um, starting on my Legere reads. <laughs> I always have Legere's because I call them insurance. Yes, they're insurance. Yes. Yes. I'm right now I'm at 10,000 feet out here in Colorado as, as Jeremy knows this high oh. altitude reads. And, uh, so I've, I've got some Legere's at the, I always in the band in the Navy band, I always had Legere's at the ready just in case, but Jill, you, you bring up a really interesting point. Um, now you said you do warm ups before rehearsals. So you said Rose and Behrman. And so for maybe people that are in the, in the presentation that might not know what those are. So the Rose Etudes, as you can see, Jeremy's kind of scrolling down with his cursor. Um, the Rose Etudes are probably one of my favorite ways to practice and warm up. I, I treat them as individual pieces of music. They're just so incredible for building sound production, articulation, technique, the, the whole thing. And and the um, as well as the Behrman studies, which I think they're what, four volumes of Behrman studies? Yeah, I just have about. this one that I remember that I memorized and that's about it. So don't, don't we can't get into much detail about those <laughs> for me. But um, the one, Jeremy, if you want to go through what you've got listed there, I think those are some great foundational um, resources for people. I used to be with the Albert and the Krebs and the, that line. Yeah. Is that what, yeah. So the Albert, you know, the, that's probably the Albert um, 24 varied scales and exercises for those who on, on the, on the, on the, the webinar that are not from, have not heard of this book. Um, it's, it's, it's basically like the Behrman, but it goes through, uh, it goes actually it's for melodic minor. So it's major and the relative melodic minor scale. Um, I actually, in my teaching, I like to pair it with the Stevenard book. Um, and I forget the Stevenard book's name. In any case, uh, if I happen to, I, I can look on my phone uh, so you all don't have to see me searching. But um, the Albert book is in, uses the minor scales. It's only two octaves. And so I actually like to start my undergrads, my, my first two year, under, like first and second years with the Albert book and then, and then have them in third and fourth year do the Behrman because that way they get a, a really nice foundation. And then uh, it's only with two octaves. It's the same pattern, just like the Behrman's. And then when you get to Behrman, then you can do the, obviously the, the whole extent of the, um, of the, of the range of the clarinet. Um, then we have the Krebs, uh, and of course the Rose Etudes and, you know, tons and tons and tons of Rose Etudes. I think the really cool thing that's coming out, if you are, if for, uh, for everyone who does not know, there are starting to have um, some Rose Etude books with piano accompaniment, and that can make it a little more interesting, you know, if especially if you're if you're at home, um, especially during these times of COVID, or if maybe you're waiting for your groups to open up again for rehearsals. Um, I know Philippe Couper has uh, at least one book, maybe two. Um, I'm actually Laura and I have switched coasts. I'm actually coming to you from the from the Adirondack Mountains, and so I'm not in my office right now, so I couldn't actually check in my in my filing cabinet. But um, uh, I Philippe Cooper has at least one book or two um, that he has actually worked with a pianist in Paris. Uh, Philippe is the Prince of Clarinet of the Paris Opera, and um, it's a great, great, great resource if you want to work on uh, intonation as well, which is really nice. Then you have the Cavallini Etudes and the Gambaro Etudes are sort of like sort of like the rose there's a couple of different books and then after a while they all sort of kind of sound the same <laughs> uh and then we all know the Brahms sonatas and the and then the cello suites um there's a couple of different editions out there of the cello suites i personally like the Della um edition i think it's published by leduc um he also has uh their violin partitas and sonatas it's called uh officially it's called cans etudes so 15 etudes but it's originally from the violin sonatas and partitas so and that, you know this this is just something oh sorry to interrupt laura but just this is just something that laura and i just sort of like really quickly put you know onto a on, onto a slide and there's i mean i mean the bottom line is that there's so much amazing repertoire out there for folks for for all of us depending on what we need to work on or if you need something new and fresh uh to work on so i mean these are just you know some ideas that we have um and it's, it's not going to work for everybody. And I think that's really, really important that everyone finds their own 
sort of way to get into the get into the groove of playing for your ensembles to where you feel like you can really tackle anything you want to work on that foundation. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I have a question for people that are listening in. Um, you know, if you if you have a practice routine, what is it if you're coming back to the clarinet or you're starting to play clarinet? How, how are you starting? Did you reach out to a teacher? Are you just are you looking at books or YouTube videos or things like that? I'm just I'm really curious the people that are listening in you're listening in for a reason either for yourself or maybe for your own students. Um, but I would just be uh, curious as to what kind of uh, resources our people listening in um, might be using. And if you can, um, I don't know if they can come off mute or put it in the chat, but I'd be very interested to see if other people have resources that they could add to what we have here. I mean, Lowell and Richard just posted two really awesome stories. and. Uh, and their background and how they came to the clarinet. I just have to give a shout out to Lowell. I'm a, I'm a student of Yehuda's and uh, when I was studying with Yehuda, he would always, he would be flying back and forth for Colonial Symphony. So we heard a lot about Colonial. So that's really fun to see that you worked with Yehuda and also a student of, of Leon Rushinoff. I mean, you know, talk about clarinet royalty there. Um, really, really neat um, executive director. Um, the, I'm sorry, served in the boards of all of New Jersey Symphony in addition to Jacksonville. And I mean, that's that's an, another amazing way to be involved in the community in addition to playing clarinet. And he, and he says he manages his own communications consultancy called Corporate Clarinetistry. Maybe we I can love all, that. Maybe we can all uh, become clients. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. Corporate. I wonder, uh, does he have a, uh, a website for that? If yeah, Lowell, Lowell, Lowell. Lola, if you have a website for this, maybe you can put that in the chat for us and we can we can continue to pick your uh, pick your brain. And then Richard says he graduated from UB in 1969 in engineering and that to play didn't have time to play in college. His uncle played in a community band and asked to play, joined numerous community bands, started taking some lessons, um, retired playing from the Dublin Wind Symphony in Hilliard community and has worked with Michelle Anderson up in Vancouver and Michelle's doing amazing work. Uh, Michelle is she's been doing online pedagogy for years and years. Um, she actually gave a talk for my for my class out in Denver about how she started her um, her uh, whole series of clarinet pedagogy classes. So for everyone listening, I would highly recommend that you reach out either look up Michelle on YouTube or reach out to her. She's also a we, we, we were students together at Aspen and she's an awesome, awesome person. Um, so she will she will go to the ever ends of the earth for anybody. So and uh, but Richard continues to say that has been very uh, have had a lot of gratitude for clarinet and what the ICA is doing. And he's trying to encourage his granddaughter to play. But she's in neuroscience. Well, I mean, see, here you go. I mean, his, you know, Richard's uh, granddaughter could become a supporter of the arts as well um, involved. So these are two really awesome stories. Um, yeah. And, and who thinks that music and science are related? I mean, you know, it just seems like music and math, music and science, there's a inherent correlation between the two. Um, oh, Digital Clarinet Academy, Ixie Chan and yep. Tiffany Valvo, great research. Yes, they are. Yep. yep. They're doing some great work, too. And also, um, uh, Cecilia Kang is also doing, a, in addition to Ixie and, and Tiffany, uh, yep. Cecilia is also doing a lot of really great stuff too. So um, I think that's the mo that's the best thing that really has popped up, um, and that's actually even what I'm sharing with my colleagues uh, at University of Denver is that I just kind of feel that the clarinet community has really embraced um, this whole online pedagogy, and people are doing all there's all sorts of there's uh, there's all sorts of different um, uh, you know clarinet academies that are out there. Um, uh, um, the professor at Boston Conservatory is running, running a series. Rob uh, Patterson. Rob Patterson. Yep, yep. I mean, I think I think that's what's really been fantastic for all of us during COVID, is that I think the clarinet community has really embraced all these, uh, has really exhausted, shall we say, <laughs> what what Zoom can do, and what the different technologies can do um, to really bring people, I mean, you know, from all over the world together, which is really, really great. Is, was there anything that came up that you actually can play synchronously with people or did, 
did it has that actually been done yet so far so far in my experience i haven't heard yeah i didn't think so yeah yeah i think there's too much of a delay i think acapella right. is one of the only ways to right to make right. something yep. to make something yeah i know that in the band we were sending our recordings in to work during the pandemic and that was that was a whole nother level of frustration because I'll bet. They, we were trying to play in small groups on acapella but it, it, it you know it just was trying to find a space in your house and keeping the dogs and the kids quiet and you know it just had its own it had its own its own um set of issues but um jeremy your hand is raised yeah sorry about that i'm 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 i'll lower the hand sorry <laughs> oh no i was just curious if you no. did you have a question <laughs> no question. well no actually i do have, i have a question for jill um jill during this during the shutdown of covid mm -hmm. was did you did you did you what kind of work did you try to like work on or chops or yeah. like, like repertoire actually or? that was I, I yeah i played a lot actually during that was also i found my center and found my my way out i actually went a lot to michael lowenstern's youtube channel hmm. um ear spasm and he was phenomenal he put together all these little play along duets and play along um yep play along duets and play along uh you know things to play along with him on on computer and then i i found a lot of just things to play along with on youtube um and so that's that's when i um that's what i would do that actually i played more in covid than i did probably during the ensemble times because we weren't going anywhere so right. um but that's what i that's where i found a, a neat little um outlet was for, was through that i find that really interesting that you said you played more during covid and yet yeah, you when you have to practice for a part, you wouldn't really have a daily routine, but yeah. you would just buckle down and and practice for your rehearsal. Again, we need, we can go into the counseling part of it later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find it very. I think it's very yeah. interesting because for me, it was just the opposite. When the band so stopped funny. playing, I, I mean, I was like, "Where's my motivation?" I, I just so did funny. not. Same I wasn't motivated. It's so Same funny. for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I ended up picking up old projects that there were projects that I, that needed to be finished. So I was really busy doing stuff, but I, the same, I mean, I practice, you know, here and there a little bit, of course, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, you know, not much. And I was actually telling my students that I felt that they were in better shape than I was because <laughs> they were practicing every day. You know, they did. They still uh, yeah. had their concerts because we were very lucky at, at, at University of Denver that we were a, we were completely in person. We didn't we were not shut down. We had lessons, ensembles, chamber music, studio class. Everything was in person with a lot of guide with a lot of um, protocols. But um, but yeah, I was joking. I was joking with my students that they were in better shape than I was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, and I think the, you mean, Jeremy, I'm sorry, you mean that you mean the. 2020 21 year not not during quarantine though right you were quarantined as well we were only we were, so yeah so at our school actually we're on the quarter system and oh. so when COVID hit we still had a full quarter so where most people were lucky they only had what maybe six to seven weeks left of their semester we still had 10 whole weeks left yeah so we went from like April 1st to like the second week of June completely online and of course there, you know, and, and so what we did in our studio, I actually, um, I, I sort of, I required, obviously we did all unaccompanied music because it was very fast. You know, we didn't have enough time to work with pianists to sort of get piano, you know, piano works recorded. So we obviously did all unaccompanied music, but what I did was I, I would give, I gave my students um, recording projects and they always had to have five pieces in mind that they wanted to work on. So between all the electronic resources of Naxos and through iTunes or Spotify or whatever resource they wanted to, and and that and they're actually they actually continued it this year. So they always have like a constant stream of pieces that they're interested in. And so now what I've done in my studio is we I have a much more collaborative approach to my students. So I'll balance like they have to do a Brahms sonata now, and then the next piece they can do a piece that they found it maybe completely crazy off the wall, and then the next piece they have to do is Stravinsky three pieces, and then so we're always rotating back and forth. And so that's what we did. That's what I brought in to COVID into my teaching, um, you know, for my college students. But this past year, this past school year, we were 100% in person. Wow. Yeah. 
It was awesome. It was really great. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And see, I was in our our band was in lockdown. I think out of the four bands in Washington, we were the ones under the most lockdown. Wow. Our first concert was July fourth. Our first real public concert was like, July fourth. Like two weeks ago, like it was July fourth. Last week, July fourth. Yeah. Your, your last concert. Our, my last concert was our first concert in fifteen months. Wow. And so you know, I decided to go out with a bang, right? You but did. But, um, you know, I, I really, I think one of the things that, um, for me, I really enjoyed, uh, there's a, U a couple of YouTube channels that had free piano, uh, piano uh, accompaniment that you could play along to. Yep. And I found that, and I found that really satisfying, um, just if I was playing a sonata or if I was, whatever I was working on, I wanted, you yeah. know, some of some more music to go with it. I found that very satisfying. And I, I still use that that now. It, it wound up at, at one point in the spring, um, having that pre-recorded music to play to was actually, uh, yeah, the color is the piano, right? Um, I That's what I used and- Well, and Laura, didn't you use one of them for your interview? I did. <laughs> I did. So it worked. It worked. It worked. I mean, and, and I'll, I'll always be grateful for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I actually had to, when I went out to interview, uh, I didn't have a pianist. And so I, I had the pre-recorded music ready to go uh, for like the Poulenc Sonata. And um, what else did I have? I had something else, but Mozart. Uh, Mozart. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Mozart. So, yeah. um, so I found it very beneficial, but I, I will say that, um, you know, trying to stay motivated during, during the quarantine was particularly difficult for me. And I, that's just really interesting, Jill, because I think you and I have kind of the same approach to practice. When I'm, when I'm finding something I have to get ready for, I'll just knuckle down and, and bust yeah. it out. Yeah. But I'm really trying to develop now that I'm, you know, retired from the band and starting a new career I'm trying to find that daily practice routine, even if it's 10 minutes a day, you know, what is, is it long tones? Is it scales? Is it an A tune? Um, I know we only have 10 minutes left, but I'd be really curious, two things from people that are still listening in. If you had to do it all over again, this is one of the questions Jeremy and I kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you had to do it all over again, would you still do clarinet? Would you still love the clarinet? And, um, oh, I see, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. And if you have only 10 or 15 minutes a day, what do you practice? If you only have, like, Jeremy, like your student that was running from rehearsal to rehearsal and coming in for lessons, like, I'm curious, if you only have 10 minutes in your day to play something, you know, and you have to be an efficient practicer, what is that for you? What is it that helps you keep your skill set up? I, I'm, I would be very interested. Warm-ups and scales, yep. Yeah. Um, what kind of warm up? Long tones and oh, close A scales. Yes, Julia, <laughs> those are the best. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Um, so, yeah, I think for me, warm ups. I love uh, Kathy Mulcahy demonstrated a really good long tone exercise that she did, where uh, she starts on a uh, a low E and then hits the octave key to a to a B and then takes five steps down the scale and she just goes up chromatically, but it's a, it's a long tone exercise where you, you know, uh, crescendo then decrescendo. Um, but I, I really, I like that warm up exercise that she does. Um, I like the close A scales as well. Yep. Um, I'd be interested if anybody has another take on long tones because I, I like to make them interesting instead of just sitting on one note for 12 beats um we, we had a thing with 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 yehuda and and most you know um most people who have studied with him uh it, he calls it christmas tree and it's basically you, you you go up chromatically but you're always coming down to like you go low e f natural e f sharp e g you know and you go up by half step but the e is always the the root and as you're as you're making the the legato you're always thinking of the lower note to try to bring up the the, the warmth of, of the lowest note uh, as you're going up the octave and uh, it's actually a lot more involved that's maybe like the maybe the quickest way to say it but that was something that 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 i i still do um 
I mean, I learned this back in 1996 and I'm still doing it. And it's just something that I really loved. Um, another question that I had as people want to um, add, oh, Jessica mentions the clarinet doctor book from Howard Klug has some nice uh, various and long tones. Um, I'm also curious now for all of us that as, you're, as we're coming out of COVID and things are starting to open up, what, you know, we, 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 we were interested in, you know, what kind of projects do you want to work on? What were, you know, what was sort of, you know, cooking for you? What kind of thoughts did you have the past 15 months, you know, that you wanted to sort of, um, you know, tackle, you know, now that we, now that we're starting playing again, we're starting to play concerts again and we, we can start to play for people again, you know, what kind of special projects or, or what other, what new interests might you have uh, during the past 15 months? You know, sometimes getting away from our, very focused lives of, you know, whether we're, you know, an anesthesiologist or a therapist or uh, on, on the board of an orchestra, um, clarinet, full-time clarinet players. Um, and we have come away from time and we have time to think about new ideas. So I'm just curious what other kind of projects and stuff people may have in mind that they want to tackle. Yeah. Well, I know for me, when I get out to Cedar City, um, the percussion teacher and I are going to be working on some marimba clarinet duets and um, uh, I'm looking forward to doing more chamber music than band music. Bye Chuck. Um, bye Chuck. Oh, bye Chuck. <laughs> Let's see, a Christmas CD with arrangements I've created. That's nice from TJ. Yep, really cool. Well, really, I think, yeah. Go ahead, Jeremy, I'm sorry. No, I was, and also very useful. I mean, yeah. you know, I there's a there's a, a group actually that I belong to in Frisco, Texas, and um, a cha little small chamber group, and and we actually started putting together our holiday concert just a month ago, you know, because we're thinking about doing it because we had so many views, and so we we're gonna start putting together our holiday concert and record it. And it'll it'll be put on. Uh, I don't know if it's Zoom or YouTube. I'm not really sure what platform we'll do, but but um, yeah, it's, that's really great. That's awesome. Um, I was actually able to uh, our my clarinet orchestra uh, group just did uh, two concerts or one concert uh, about a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we brought in actually a couple of big band tunes. So I actually got to pull out the tenor saxophone and and play and, and piddle on that. So that was that was that was my challenge for the. <laughs> Working on your doubling. Uh, for, yes, yes. It was fun because my husband plays saxophone, so we own all the saxophones. So um so that was it was a lot of fun actually the, to be able to um to get some notes out and actually and actually play with the group on saxophone. Hmm. Richard says he has an aerophone go. It plays like a sax and simulates 50 instruments. Oh, that's cool. That's my wife amazing. likes it sound and I can wear earphones. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice, nice. I bought a flute. I bought a flute so I can work on some of my doubling skills. And that's been kind of nice mm -hmm. just to, um, you know, I, actually Chuck West was kind of helping me with the, the embouchure, the flute embouchure. Um, and he described it as an air read, which I, I'm a very visual mm -hmm. person. If you're just talking to me, I don't learn as well, but if you demonstrate, and, and I can watch and you model for me. But he was like, yeah, it's like an air read. And, and being able to visualize that um, has really helped me develop my limited skill set on the flute. So um, yeah, so I've been, I've been doing a little bit of that as well. It's too bad he had to go, but didn't, didn't he just publish a book during COVID on woodwind methods? He's had that methods book for a long time. And it, okay. it, it's a great book oh my yeah. gosh um okay. you can get it on amazon um but yeah. it you know what's covered... called laura um it's, woodwind it's... method uh, i have it too I'll, um i think I can oh stop there, there it is it. there it is yep woodman yeah it's, woodman method it's fantastic it has the fingering charts for all five um uh you know or excuse me all four woodwind instruments and um I love it. And I, he's been so instrumental in, in just helping me. Um, Pun intended. Said, we spent a whole afternoon playing flute and oboe and it was, it was wonderful. I mean, he's, he's Neat. just, so, he's so yeah, talented. The book is, the book is geared toward those who are teaching like music educators on yeah. 
I'm playing. So it's, it's the common mistakes and common, you know, and, and it's really good as I looked at it too, for going, okay, if I were for, cause I've helped teach some of my friends, kids with, that's another thing that I've been able to do actually in the last several years is I, I teach my friends, kids for free because I am not a trained musician and it will, if they want to pay me, I, I donate it back to the band. So, um, they, um, so I have, I used his book to figure out, okay, what are they doing wrong? And what are they doing? And like, Oh, it's like, it's so it's frustrating to me because I'm like, okay, I know how I learned how to play the clarinet, but I don't know how to teach somebody how to, how to, you know, back to beginner. So that's been very interesting to me to, um, go back and help the, the younger kids, um, to, uh, to learn. So, Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think it's an excellent book. And since I'll be teaching a Woodwind Methods course in the fall, you know, I've just had several great conversations of, you know, you're you're teaching that next generation of music educators to teach the next generation of musicians. And, you, you know, you I'm, you can't take it lightly. And just being right. able to help those students form good embouchures and making a sound right away, a good sound, you know, right away is so so critical so it, I think it's it's a good it's a really good resource so but um I like the duet playing duets with yourself I've done yeah. that I love yeah that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone else have any questions I think we're almost at time but does anyone have any other questions or thoughts yeah questions yeah or this additions is, yeah anything we missed anything that's really important this is so fun. <laughs> Thank you guys for inviting me. It was really neat. Oh, oh, Jill, your contributions were wonderful. Thank you. And I don't know why you say that you you are a trained clarinetist. And I think what you provide for teaching those students where you live. And then we have a student in common that she sent to me that's that's yeah. doing, really, doing really well. And, um, and so, you know, she and I are kind of working collaboratively together. And I just, yeah. I love that. Right. Yep. We're like proud mamas. <laughs> I know. I know. Even though we're still only 20. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly. 29 plus. Yeah, so. yeah. We met oh, in 19. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, oh, Jessica, that's awesome. That's awesome. And Jessica, are, are the meetings for ICA, will they continue to be on Zoom? Uh, yes. And I assume that once we actually meet in Reno next year, um, that we'll also have some some meetups there and uh, we have tons of committees we're actually going to be adding a jazz committee and possibly a world music committee so perfect um, as always the committees are completely open we do have set members to to start the committee but then we open the meetings up and everybody can participate and join in on the initiatives that they're working on and we do have a clarinet enthusiast committee so if you aren't really interested in some of the more academic nature things, please join us for that because there's lots of great work going on there. Uh, great and, question in the chat. Yeah, I, I just I was just uh, writing to Richard. Uh, Jessica, do you know if there would happen to be um, a list, do you know? We don't have a list, but that can be added to our, our um, activities. We can certainly <laughs> do that. We can the, start working the... on that clarinet choir and band database. And I think the clarinet choir one is done and we're working on expanding that into Europe and possibly Asia for people who are, you know, not local uh, right. to the U S. So that's, that's something that we're working on, but I'll pass that along to probably the enthusiast committee and to the pedagogy committee. And they can start working on that because that's, that would be a great resource. And maybe we can just create a page on the website where people who are private teachers can just, you know, input their information, their contact. We do have the give a lesson, take a lesson, program which offers free lesson like a free lesson with a teacher so that's on the website um, but that's that's a good idea yeah and I think one of the final things I'll say is um you know I met one of my clarinet buddies Mark Taylor now Mark is an IT specialist um at, I think it's the University of Northern Illinois I want to say but he um he plays bass clarinet and he goes to like every ICA convention and that's how we met um, he just loves playing bass. He plays in his community band. But back in January, um, he became my scale partner. And so mm -hmm. he was kind of my little support network and he would play his scales and I would play mine. And then we would comment in, in chat like, hey, did you play your scales today? Yeah, I did mine. And it was a really nice way to kind of stay accountable. And I would I would suggest that anyone that's still listening that 
if you have a partner and you know, whether they're an adult enthusiast, beginner, whatever, it doesn't matter. But if you have kind of like a support buddy who can say, Hey, did you play your scales today? And yeah. then you're like, Oh yeah, I got to do that. <laughs> um, and, and you know, and also, and, and with, and, and you know, there's a lot of really great duo music. So you can, you know, maybe like a recital or something. That's one thing we didn't talk about was other, we didn't touch upon was, you know, other ways be, just besides large ensemble. But if you wanted to like play little recitals at like, like a community, like a community, um, uh, like, um, like, a, well, I don't know, like, a, ah, the word is escaping, but like, but hospitals or a library or assisted living, they're always looking for some sort of entertainment for their residents. Music uh, therapy. Music therapy. Yes, exactly. I mean, those are also really other good ideas. And that's just, there usually is some sort of activity, uh, person that's on staff for those, um, for those places. And you just call them up and just inquire. Um, I know this is something that's done at our university. Um, mm -hmm. Our, a lot of our chamber groups go out and play for the assisted living uh, in the, in, in the community. Yeah. You know, and, and I played for the nurses on the ICU ward down in Texas. they, they were printing out music for me to play for them because they wanted, they, they love the live music so much that they just, they, they were like, can you keep playing? Can you keep playing? And they, they went and printed out star Wars. They went and printed out, they were like, just please don't stop playing. And I thought, you know, that's an Avenue where live music, you know, especially for our healthcare workers where they're putting in those long hours and, you know, be able to provide that kind of live music for them. Um, that was kind of like my, my answer to music therapy in that moment. Right. So, um, yeah, I think that's what you're saying. Jeremy is spot on. Yeah, absolutely. So any well, other questions or Jessica, this was only, was this only an hour? Is that right? Well, I think Mary had intended some of the sessions to just be 30 minutes, but we didn't oh. have anything after that. So it's not a big deal. So don't worry <laughs> okay. about that. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we just had some pre-recorded things happening, so it's not a big deal today, but I appreciate you guys taking the extra time because I think this is really important. And oh, yeah. um, I do Absolutely. think we need to wrap up because um, I have to get this video edited and uploaded for people who didn't join us because they were watching some of the and that was something And that was something that Mar I think uh, Margaret asked if uh, where, where she could download. Oh, no. Uh, and if, Jeremy, if you want to send me the slides, I can just put them on the oh, presentation. It was just the slides. Okay, I just want to make sure. I thought that I quickly read that she wanted to get the, the video of this as well. But um, I, I, I sent my email to, um, to Margaret, but I can also uh, send them to you too, Jessica. Great, and I'll just put them on your uh, on the guidebook on your session so people can just download it as a supplemental cool. resource. Jessica, is it okay if I get to you that next week only because I have such a limited re uh, internet up yeah, here? Yeah, no, mountain? that's fine. That's All totally right, fine. great, great, great. And, you know, the, uh, we just wanted to make, you know, just, you know, a, as we wrap up and stuff, we just wanted to extend our thoughts and prayers to Todd Kurtstetter and, and his family and friends. Um, Todd was a really, really, really great guy. And uh, he loved the ICA and everyone knows that. And he was just a wonderful person. So we just want to, on behalf of Laura, Jill and Jessica, myself, just uh, send our thoughts and prayers to his family and friends. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and so. we will be having a, a tribute to Todd during the award ceremony on the 31st. Uh, I think right. it's at 7, 7 or 7.30. I'll have to look at the schedule. So I um, hope you all can join us for that. Um, it, it's certainly tragic. And as you know, Todd was the treasurer for almost, uh, I think, seven years. So Long time. Yeah, long yeah. time. Yep. This, this event was really important to him. And he was a great player and a great teacher and a great person. So. Yeah. Dynamite. Um, but thank you, yeah. thank you all so much for your time. And um, yes. we have another session starting at two thirty, so just a little bit of a break in between now and then. And uh, it is a Cape Daisy recital, so we hope you're joining. Uh, okay. You can get the link for that on YouTube or in the guidebook. And we will see you then. Great. And I just want to say thank you, Jeremy, for working together on this. Of course, I love working on oh, anything yeah. with you. Likewise. And, um, and, and thanks, thanks, big thanks to Jill. Yeah. Oh gosh, I I tell you, I it's I was beyond honored. So I, I really I really am happy to that it you know my clarinet playing brought me to here. <laughs> so and this, and, this, and this will be really great. I think I think this conversation could grow and grow. I like we were saying before, as as we're starting to you know all sorts of new concerts and projects and teaching that will start to come out of this 
of our forced uh, forced fun lockdown. <laughs> yeah, and Laura, I, I, need, I need to be your practice buddy or back or, back, or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down with it. We'll, we'll yeah. keep each other honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, All right, everyone. Thank great. you very much. It's great to see everybody. Hugs, kisses. Bye-bye. Rest of Bye. your day. The rest of your day. Thanks, Jessica.